So my work in masonry, as you've just heard, and as many of you already knew, is primarily about being this advocate, facilitator, and consultant for our tradition's contemplative dimension, which I do in part through the Academy of Reflection and the Masonic Legacy Society. The contemplative dimension of masonry is the one through which we encounter the deepest possible understandings of our symbolism, as well as the most relevant applications for our lives in, in the world. When properly practiced, the contemplative approach to masonry grounds itself in scholarship and critical reasoning, while also reverently opening the heart and mind to deeper potentials of intuition, inspiration, and creativity. While I often speak more about the methods and benefits of contemplation, this time, somewhat like last time, I am sharing reflections and insights from my own contemplations on this degree, intendance of the building. And especially as it is practiced in the Southern jurisdiction, as that is where my experience lies. I believe it's an underappreciated degree uh, in fact, many valleys no longer perform the degree or even simply communicate its basic lessons. In the valleys where it is offered in some way, it is often in an abbreviated form and with little to no instruction about some of its deeper implications. This is a sad state of affairs because this degree has important messages about our nature as human beings and our relationship with deity and a call to action that is sorely needed in our times. In keeping with my obligations, I will only reference things that are already found in publicly available versions of the eighth degree ritual. I will also draw from authoritative commentaries on it, as well as look to the ancient wisdom tradition of Kabbalah as a catalyst for further insight. I also need to say that in the interest of time, there are many important symbolic elements of this degree that I won't be addressing. Those and other mysteries of the eighth degree are left for your own discovery, and I encourage you to seek them out. As is always the case in masonry, nobody speaks for the fraternity as a whole, and so I welcome you to think deeply and critically about what I share and to form your own questions, insights, and understandings, no matter how different they might be from mine. One thing I can promise is that I won't make claims about any meanings intended by the writers of the ritual unless there is good scholarly evidence to support those claims. So I will frequently quote my sources, which I will strive to consistently mark by stating quote and end quote throughout the presentation. Now, let's get started. The instructions of the current ritual state, quote, the degrees of this rite are not for those who are content with the mere ceremonies and uninterested in the minds of wisdom buried beneath the surface. How far you will advance in your understanding of Freemasonry depends upon you alone. Here, as everywhere in the world, darkness struggles with light, clouds and shadows intervene between you and the truth. When you become imbued with the morality of masonry and it familiar to you, then be prepared to receive more lofty philosophical instruction, end quote. In an older version of the ritual, it is added, quote, here as in all the degrees, you meet with the emblems and the names of deity, the true knowledge of whose character and attributes it has ever been a chief object of masonry to perpetuate. To appreciate his infinite greatness and goodness, to rely implicitly upon his providence, to revere and venerate him as the supreme architect, creator, and legislator of the universe, is the first of Masonic duties, end quote. And then in Morals and Dogma, at the close of the chapter on this degree, is written, quote, the symbols and ceremonies of Masonry have more than one meaning. They rather conceal than disclose the truth. They hint it only, at least, and their varied meanings are only to be discovered by reflection and study. Truth is not only symbolized by light, but as the ray of light is separable into rays of different colors, so is truth separable into kinds. It is the province of masonry to teach all truths, not moral truth alone, but political and philosophical, and even religious truth 
so far as concerns the great and essential principles of each, end quote. Here we have a clear declaration that there are many ways to appropriately interpret the things we experience in Masonry. And in doing so, one of the primary aims is for us to more fully know God. So now I invite you to join me in considering how this degree is relevant to that aim. In order to do so, we are going to be referencing Kabbalah or Kabbalah, which is introduced in the fourth degree of the current Southern jurisdiction ritual, where it is explained as an indispensable aid for gaining deeper insight and understanding of our right. In case you need a little refresher, Kabbalah is the esoteric tradition of Judaism. And one of its central symbolic systems is the tree of life, a diagram of 10 basic divine powers or principles of creation called sephirot, and also illustrating their relationships with each other. And you see that diagram here. By the way, as I go through here, I'm going to be doing my best to pronounce these Hebrew terms. I've been a student of of Kabbalah for many, many years. I've heard a lot of these terms pronounced differently, even by native speakers of Hebrew. So please bear with me if, if something I pronounce sounds like fingernails on a chalkboard to you. Much of the actual work in traditional Jewish Kabbalah is concerned with gaining deeper insight and understanding of scripture through various forms of contemplative practice. Kabbalists hold that it is possible to have more than one meaningful and valid interpretation of things, and that these can be very different from each other without negating each other. Let's start our work of seeking a deeper interpretation of the eighth degree by going back to the beginning, and I mean the very beginning as it is told in the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. In the Hebrew words of this scripture, the Spirit of God is Ruach Elohim, and ruach is a Hebrew word that not only means spirit, but also breath. It is immediately after this spirit or breath moves that God gives birth to the light. Note the order here, breathing and then illumination. This order is followed later when God creates Adam by first forming his body from the soil which is called Adama in Hebrew, and then breathing the breath of life, the Nishmat Chaim, into his nostrils. At that moment of receiving God's exhalation as his inspiration, Adam becomes a living being, and not only alive, but made in the image of God, illuminated with intelligence and with the ability to speak and thus capable of naming things. On that note, let's give special attention to the Hebrew name of God used in these particular scriptures, which is Elohim. The I am suffix, im, means it is a plural noun. Furthermore, the actual Hebrew words of that text have God saying, quote, let us make humans in our image, end quote. Here we have God unequivocally insisted upon as the one and only supreme being by Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike, nonetheless refer referring to God's self in the plural. This is a mystery that ought to grab our attention, for it suggests that either our very scriptures contradict most of the theologies based upon them, or that there is a deeper understanding of both to be grasped. With this mystery in mind, we can look to the eighth degree and note that on one side of its jewel is the divine name Achad, which you see on the right there. As a noun, Achad means one, and our ritual tells us 
that as a divine name, it refers to the one God who is the source of all. However, the word Akkad can also refer to a number of things that are united together as one. So it is that Akkad as a name for God not only reminds us of God as the transcendent one who creates all things, but is also the imminent one in and through which all things are united together. The name Akkad is a reminder that nothing exists entirely separate from God, that God is present in all things, and thus that all things are actually united in the dimension of spirit. Achad is a name for the one who is also many, just like Elohim. Now let's turn our attention to the other side of the jewel on the left, where we find the term ben Hurim. Ben Hurim is traditionally translated from Hebrew as son of nobles, where Ben literally means son, but may also mean a descendant or disciple, and Hur means noble. Hur is also directly related to the verb Kara, meaning to burn or to glow. Thus, on the whole, the Hur in Ben Kurim conveys the more general sense of brightness and illumination. Once again, note that the im suffix signifies the plural. But to whom does this term actually refer? Who are these noble, bright, glowing ones, and who are their descendants or disciples? These are mysteries not directly answered in the lessons of this degree, so we should consider some different possibilities in response to this mysterious term. First, some Masonic scholars have speculated that the name Hiram was based on the word Kur. So it is possible that Ben Kurim is simply intended to mean one who is the follower of those who are like Hiram, or more to the point, a Freemason. To get to another possibility, let's refer to one of the other key symbols of this degree. On the flap of the apron is a triangle bearing the ciphered initials of not only A for Achad and B for Ben Khurim, but also SH for Shekinah. Shekinah is a feminine Hebrew word literally meaning a dwelling place, and it is used as a name for the presence of God in this world. According to Kabbalah, Shekinah can be understood as the feminine personification of the spirit of God, Ruach Elohim, mentioned at the beginning of Genesis, as well as the Holy Spirit, Ruach HaKodesh, and the divine wisdom, Chokmah in Hebrew, Sophia in Greek. The divine wisdom is clearly addressed as her in the book of Proverbs. Here is how she speaks of herself in chapter 8 of that book. Quote, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. End quote. Shekinah is also the pillar of smoke and flame that led the Israelites through the wilderness and appeared in the tabernacle and later in the temple above the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. She is therefore called the Shekinah glory and the glory of God. Keeping in mind that Freemasons dedicate our labors to the glory of God, it should be no surprise that Shekinah has long been of interest to us. In Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, dated 1878, the entry on Shekinah reads, quote, The Shekinah was the symbol of the divine glory, but the true glory of divinity is truth, and divine truth is therefore the Shekinah of Freemasonry. This is symbolized by light, which is no longer used by us as a substitute for the Shekinah, or the divine glory, but as its symbol the physical expression of its essence, end quote. Note that Mackey has just said 
that the light we seek in masonry represents Shekhinah, the divine glory and truth of God. Many years prior to Mackey's statement, Shekhinah was already associated with the blazing star of the craft lodge, as noted in the publication of John Brown's Master Key through the Three Degrees in the late 1790s. Then in 1846, the Reverend Brother George Oliver also makes this connection in An Apology for the Freemasons, where he reviews the story of Genesis and says, quote, the Shekinah, or blazing star from heaven, was placed as a guard to protect the tree of life. From this Shekinah proceeded that celebrated Kabbalistical symbol of the deity called the Sephirot consisting of 10 splendors, three of which are placed as the united light of God, or crown of glory, end quote. In the same paragraph, after citing the Kabbalistic text Sefer Yetzirah, Oliver goes on to report this, quote, in one of the ineffable degrees of masonry called Master in Israel, the blazing star is made to consist of five points, like a royal crown, in the center of which appears the initial of the sacred name, end quote. We should note that master in Israel is another name for the intendant of the building degree. And the Franken manuscript of 1783 confirms Oliver's description of these symbols. Now, as a brief aside, since Oliver has mentioned Kabbalah so clearly, and especially because the tree of life is so important to the Scottish Rite, we should take a moment to note some interesting parallels between the apron of this degree and the tree of life. So just looking at these two images side by side, you can already kind of see this parallel, these three triangles that compose the primary structure of the tree, and the three symbols arranged vertically on this apron. But now I want to draw your attention to this upper triangle, the one that is marked with the numbers one, two, and three. This is called the supernal triangle, and it represents a kind of indivisible trinity of the fundamental forces in creation. Uh, one, Keter, represents the crown, the divine crown, the absolute will, the perfect form and force of creation uh, as it is about to unfold itself in the act of creating and manifesting all that is. Well, this parallels on the apron, this triangle that holds the initials of Akkad, Ben Kurim, and Shekinah. Interestingly, uh, we can think of those th three things as a kind of indivisible trinity, Achad being the creative force, uh, Ben Kurim representing the, the light that proceeds from that force as kind of like a child or a son, if you will, and then Shekinah as being the divine wisdom that surrounds and, and penetrates all of what is being unfolded and manifested. That divine wisdom that is the plan for creation. And then we have the second triangle, the ethical or moral triangle, corresponding with the scales. And the scales have a lot of, of moral meaning to them within Scottish Rite symbolism. But more especially, that sixth sphere that you see there that is named Teferit. It is, uh, the, the meaning of that name is beauty, but that beauty is the beauty of harmony, of equilibrium, and balance, of mediation, of moderation. And so again, you see a direct relevance to what is on the apron there with those scales. And then finally, that triangle, the, what's called the astral triangle, that's the triangle in which human consciousness most typically resides. And you'll notice the ninth sphere there, Yesod, is called the foundation. That's, that's what Yesod means, is foundation. And we see the ninth sphere paralleling the nine-pointed star that we currently use 
and Southern jurisdiction ritual there. So just some interesting parallels. I can't say for sure that that was all intended, but it sure fits nicely. Now, back to the blazing star. In 1850, Oliver published a book entitled Symbol of Glory, showing the object and end of Freemasonry, in which he quoted the lecture from a version of the fourth degree secret master, which said, quote, I have seen a blazing star or the Shekinah, end quote. Several paragraphs later, in his own words, he says, quote, the primitive blazing star of masonry had five points, end quote. Further on in that chapter, he offers this, quote, the continental definition is the blazing star represents the sacred name of God as an universal spirit who enlivens our hearts, purifies our reason, increases our knowledge, and makes us better men, end quote. We should note that, consistent with what Oliver reports, older versions of the eighth degree apron bear a five-pointed star instead of the nine-pointed star in current use by the Southern jurisdiction. Within the five-pointed star, <coughs> excuse me, are three Hebrew yuds, <coughs> each the initial of one of the three sacred names spoken along with the name Shekinah at an important moment in this degree. Furthermore, the, the McClanahan script for the eighth degree, a script once used in the Northern Masonic jurisdiction, specifies that over the master should hang a blazing star with five points and in its center, three yuds, all surrounded by an interlaced triple triangle. In the lecture of that version, the master also says, quote, you will still advance towards the light, towards that star, toward the star blazing in the distance, which is an emblem of the divine truth given by God to the first men and preserved amid all the vicissitudes of ages in the traditions and teachings of masonry, end quote. Although we now use the nine-pointed star in connection with the triple triangle of lights in this degree, the language of the ritual still refers to it as the blazing star and an emblem of divine truth and still has the divine name within it. Thus, we have the blazing star present in the eighth degree in a way that clearly denotes it as an emblem of Shekinah. According to Kabbalists, Shekinah is not only revered as the pillar of smoke and flame, as the divine wisdom and the Holy Spirit, she is also the breath of life, the Nishmat Chaim that God breathed into Adam. This is a very important point because the story of Genesis tells us that we are all descendants of Adam, and so the breath of life is inherited by all human beings. Therefore, among her other manifestations, Shekinah may be regarded as the breath and light of life within each of us, regardless of race, religion, politics, or any other factor that distinguishes one human being from another, even our sins. She is thus not only our spiritual connection with God, but also with each other. We are all joined by the one divine spirit of life in and around all of us. The book of Genesis makes it clear that Adam failed to understand and realize his unity with God. Adam's ignorance of the Shekinah as the light of truth and the breath of life within him meant that he could not fully appreciate the blessings of Eden. And so he and all of his descendants were fated to suffer in our sense of separation from God. Kabbalah helps us understand this more deeply by suggesting that Adam is often best understood as the whole of humanity rather than taken literally as an historical person. In this sense, Adam represents the totality of all who ever lived or ever will live. Yet in either case, a Kabbalistic reading of Genesis suggests that Shekinah nonetheless dwells in each of us, whether we know it or not. We would not be alive without our earthly matter, Adama, 
being wedded with her. But most of us are like Adam in that we do not consciously realize her presence within, and we are therefore relatively unresponsive to her, which is to say that we who are supposed to be wedded to her are figuratively dead to her. She is thus the great widow, ever seeking to raise us to awareness of our birthright, our union with God, and our union with each other through her. So it is that we may now understand the term ben kurim more deeply and mystically. The bright glow alluded to by the root word kur is a reminder of Shekinah, the blazing star, the glory of God. The plurality indicated by the suffix im gives kurim the meaning of all beings illuminated by her. For Masons to acknowledge one another as ben kurim is therefore not unlike the traditional Hindu greeting namaste, which means I bow to the divine in you. It is an acknowledgement that you and I, all of us, are of the Akhad, the one who is the source of all, the giver of the breath of life and the light of truth present in this world and within us as Shekinah. Now, should anyone think that I, Mackie, Oliver, and a few other brothers are merely asserting our own personal views in this inter interpretation, I point out that the shared identity of Shekinah, divine wisdom, and the presence of God within every soul is overtly declared in the 32nd degree to be the holy doctrine of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. That's the literal term, the holy doctrine of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. There are numerous, numerous references to this doctrine in the Scottish Rite Ritual Monitor and Guide. Having jumped from the 8th degree to the 32nd, it's now pertinent to return back to the 4th degree, where the Master tells the candidate, quote, Like the light you bear, which yet you cannot see, truth and the lost word, which are light, are within reach of every man that lives, would he but open his eyes and see. The broad highway of duty, straight as an arrow, leads directly to them, end quote. Now, in that statement about the light you bear, you may now recognize another allusion to the fourth in, within the fourth degree to the very same mystery we are examining in this degree. The lesson of that degree emphasizes duty as the means to more fully awaken to the light we already bear, which we now recognize by the name Shekinah. The etymology of the word duty traces back to the Latin debere and debitum, which mean debt. In short, a duty is a moral obligation to actually do something in return for something we have received. Furthermore, because duty, as we speak of it here, is a moral obligation, it cannot be something imposed upon us like a tax or some form of servitude. It must instead freely well up from the depths of the heart. In this degree, we are reminded that we each have received the divine breath, and that through Shekinah, we are each one with God as well as all of humanity. So, if we feel a sense of obligation and gratitude for the divine breath of Shekinah, how are we to perform a fitting duty that puts our knowledge to practical use? To begin making our way toward an answer, recall that when God created Adam, he stated, his stated purpose was not only to rule over all the earth and its creatures, more especially, humanity was meant to tend and care for the Garden of Eden, in which God had placed the Tree of Life. In Kabbalah, Eden is often regarded as a metaphor for living in blissful awareness of the presence of God, not a place, but a state of consciousness. It is in that state of consciousness that Adam was made to dwell. But Adam's initial innocence 
is the innocence of all human beings when we are infants. It is blissful ignorance. Then Adam's emerging sense of individuality and free will, his desire for a physical mate, their temptation by the serpent, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, shame about their nakedness, and ejection from Eden represents the natural developmental process for human beings. When we are first born, our consciousness is pure, simple, innocent, but also ignorant and foolish. Yet, even in infancy, like Adam, we start becoming aware of the complexity of existence, beginning with our desires and our differences from each other, our vulnerabilities, and the suffering we cannot escape because of them. This awareness continues to grow, especially in the turbulence and anxiety of puberty and adolescence, so that by the time we are mature adults, most of us consider ourselves completely separate individuals and feel some degree of aloneness in what seems to be an excruciatingly complicated dog-eat-dog -dog world. Genesis portrays the terrible depths of this suffering in the story of Adam's sons, Cain and Abel, in which Cain's competitiveness, envy, and jealousy lead him to murder his own brother. When God asks Cain where Abel is, Cain replies, am I my brother's keeper? Thus Cain represents all of us who have forgotten that we are spiritually one with everyone else, whether we like them or not. Cain's actions, like those of the ruffians who slew Hiram, show us the worst consequences of that ignorance. The price Cain must pay is to travel even further from Eden, even deeper into the complex illusions of separation from God and division from other human beings. The story of Genesis can make it seem as if there is no way back to the peace and harmony of the Garden of Eden and the tree of life. Some people have even used it to teach that earthly existence is a prison we must endure until we leave this body after death. But we should recall that the underlying reason we suffer in this way is because we have forgotten who and what each of us actually is, a ben Kurim. Our duty in gratitude for the life and light we have received, is therefore to think and act in ways that reflect our spiritual unity, our mystic tie, and thereby increasingly allow Shekinah to shine through us and dispel the darkness that is the illusion of separation from God and our fellow creatures. My feeling of this duty is what has motivated me to serve contemplative practice in masonry. As a common opening charge for our craft lodges um, says, wisdom dwells with contemplation. There we must seek her. Now, in our contemplation of this degree, or any other for that matter, we should carefully consider the title we each receive. In this case, it is intendant of the building. So what is that building and how are we to tend it? A Kabbalistic interpretation of Genesis holds that all of creation was and still is sanctified by God. Recall that God clearly declares that each act of creation and thus everything in the natural world is good. We haven't spoiled that basic fact. Our fall from Eden didn't break creation. The whole cosmos is still one great temple erected and inhabited by the great architect of the universe. In terms of both an edifice and an ongoing construction project, it is the grandest building that we intendants of the building are charged to tend. So if that's the building, then in light of all we have seen, what does it mean to tend it? To answer that question, we'll contemplate words from the lectures in the McClanahan and Magnum Opus versions of the ritual and commentaries and morals and dogma, some of which are still referenced in the current Southern jurisdiction text, A Bridge to Light. 
For the next few minutes, I invite you to breathe peacefully and open your heart and mind. Here begins the reading. Masonry does not occupy itself with crying down this world, nor exhort us to detach our hearts from this earthly life as empty, fleeting, and unworthy, and fix them upon heaven as the only sphere, deserving the love of the loving or the meditation of the wise. It teaches that man has high duties to perform and a high destiny to fulfill on this earth. It is here his influences are to operate. It is his house and not a tent, his home and not merely a school. He is sent into this world not to be constantly hankering after, dreaming of, preparing for another, but to do his duty and fulfill his destiny on this earth to do all that lies in his power to improve it, to render it a scene of elevated happiness to himself, to those around him, to those who are to come after him. His life here is a part of his immortality, and this world also is among the stars. The law of our being is love of life and its interests and adornments not a low or sensual love, not love of wealth, of fame, of ease, of power, of splendor, not low worldliness, but the love of earth as the garden on which the creator has lavished such miracles of beauty. Those only who feel a deep interest in and affection for this world will work resolutely for its amelioration. Those who undervalue this life naturally become querulous and discontented and lose their interest in the welfare of their fellows. To serve them, and so to do our duty as Masons, we must feel that the object is worth the exertion and be content with this world in which God has placed us until he permits us to remove to a better one. He is here with us and does not deem this an unworthy world. The brightness of the soul shines through this visible and sometimes darkened life, through all its surrounding cares and labors. The humblest life may feel its connection with its infinite source. Thus earth, which binds many in chains, is to the mason both the starting place and the goal of immortality. Many it buries in the rubbish of dull cares and wearying vanities, but to the Mason, it is the lofty mount of meditation where heaven and infinity and eternity are spread before him and around him. There will always be in this world wrongs to forgive, suffering to alleviate, sorrow asking for sympathy, necessities and destitution to relieve, and ample occasion for the exercise of active charity and beneficence. And he who sits unconcerned amidst it all, perhaps enjoying his own comforts and luxuries the more, by contrasting them with the hungry and ragged destitution and shivering misery of his fellows, he is not contented, but selfish and unfeeling. He is the faithless steward that embezzles what God has given him in trust for the impoverished and suffering among his brethren. The true Mason must be and must have a right to be content with himself. And he can be so only when he lives not for himself alone, but for others also who need his assistance and have a claim upon his sympathy. Charity is the great channel, it has well been said, through which God passes all his mercy upon mankind. God himself is love, and every degree of charity that dwells in us is the participation of the divine nature. Here ends the reading. Now, 
in my recent reflections on this degree and the meaning of the blazing star and the words of this degree, I was inspired to write down a poem. And I want to share that poem with you now. Oh, contemplate the blazing star and let it guide your thoughts afar from common notions about light as it is sensed through earthly sight. So may the mystic quest begin to fully know the light within. It shines unto your inner eye, more constant than the sun on high, the power from which mind is wrought, projecting emblems of each thought. It paints the scenes of fancy's flight and glows within your dreams at night. Still farther in beyond these veils, it radiates through higher scales where no figure, hue, tint, or shade fades or filters its pure cascade. This beam that lights you like a lamp and seals your soul with heaven's stamp, evoked with holy wisdom's breath and flowing from eternal depth, this glory on your mercy seat that makes you whole, alive, complete, is the presence of truth most high, the essence of the mystic tie the shared flame of all creation, the one root of emanation, the light and life in everyone, the ever-present inner sun. And so your life stands not apart, but communes with all heart to heart. Thus in love you most truly are, illumined by our blazing star. In summary, to begin serving as an intendant of the building is to be mindful that we, each and all, are Ben Kurim, the children of bright, shining Shekinah, the divine light and holy breath of Achad, which is the source and the unity of everything that is. Then, in contemplation and mindfulness of our oneness with God and each other, listening deeply for the voice of divine wisdom, the glorious and holy presence of Shekinah, and continually serving charity, which is selfless, universal divine love, as our consistent aim in living with each other and tending to God's creation, this magnificent ongoing project that is the temple of all temples will be made complete. Thus, we better fulfill our duty as intendants of the building. Thank you.